Hello and welcome to GOMA Talks APT7. This is the second discussion in a series of events in partnership between GOMA and ABCRN. Exploring Australia's place in the Asian century during the seventh Asia-Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art. These sessions are interactive and we invite audience members here at GOMA and also those watching via the live stream to tweet or SMS their comments in for the panellists to consider using the hashtag GOMATalks or the phone number 04888talks. And today we're talking about Australia, Asia and events that shape the world. But hang on, that's too big. So to help that make sense, we're going to talk about memory, storytelling and the many ways in which that shaping of the world happens in our lives, art, cultural memory and ways of dealing with change. And to do so, we're joined by a panel of artists, commentators, filmmakers and historians. They're all storytellers. We'll meet them properly very soon. But the shorthand version is to say that we have artist, filmmaker and screenwriter Beck Cole from Central Australia. Hi, Beck. Hello. <laughs> Academic and collector of oral histories Natalie Nguyen from Melbourne. Hi, Natalie. Hello. Writer, commentator and community worker Paula Aboud from Sydney. Welcome, Paula. Hi. And joining us by Skype from Frankfurt is Iranian artist Paristu Farah. And Paristu, it's lovely to have you as part of an international conversation. How now, you, everybody? I'm going to be moving back and forward between all of you in this conversation, but as a way to introduce the panel to you, I'm going to go briefly to each of you. Now, Beck Cole, as a Wiramungu woman, how important is it to explore memory in your filmmaking? I mean, you've done a lot with contemporary stories too, haven't you? I have. Um, I'm, I guess it's something that I, I'm quite interested in. I have did a... Um, quite a big historical documentary series called First Australians, which focused, you know, deeply in history and, you know, the records and people's living memories and personal stories. Um, so I guess it's something that, you know, I, I am interested in and have explored quite a bit in, in my work, um, particularly in my documentary work um, and to a degree in my um, drama work as well. Now, Natalie Nguyen, your academic work at the National Centre for Australian Studies at Monash University, it's particularly concerned with the experiences of the Vietnamese diaspora here. What is it that you're wanting to explore? Is it stories of monumental change or the experience of the everyday? Um, well, I've, I've always been interested in memory. It's from my own background as a um, child refugee. Um, so I've always been conscious of a time before when life was normal and then there's this great schism and then we became refugees. And I think in, in, for, for all refugees there is that, uh, always that consciousness of the time before uh, and when life, when you had certain expectations of life, when, when your family had certain expectations and life was normal and then something terrible happened and then you became a refugee and then everything changed. Uh, and the, the refugee experience uh, involves a great deal of loss uh, and a great deal of grief. And some people never quite recover from that. Even if they manage to reconstruct new lives overseas, there's always that, that, that grief underlying, underlying their lives. Um, and I think that's... I've always been interested in memory for that reason. And I'm, I'm in, a, in a situation where I'm able to, to, to do research and explore uh, women's... I've, I've been exploring women's memories of the past and I'm now beginning to explore um, the, the memories of uh, South Vietnamese soldiers and veterans here in Australia. And we'll hear more about that work um, soon. Now, Paula Aboud, you're a filmmaker and writer as well as a cultural development worker. Is storytelling a practical tool for you in policy work as well as art? Um, yeah, I think storytelling, a lot of our um, memories, I guess, get told through storytelling and I think the communities I work with similarly um, with the Vietnamese women's experiences and any community experience, I think memory can be something very empowering and it can be a comfort zone and a, a place of refuge sometimes, but it, equally I think it can be um, traumatic as well, especially if you've been, I've worked with a lot of um, refugee communities and communities who've been through trauma and torture experiences. So memory can also, um, calling up memories can sometimes re-traumatise people, but 
really storytelling is about coming to voice and it's a really important part of I guess community work because community work really is around storytelling and people getting to tell their stories and the broader community learning to listen in different ways to those stories. And the whole ethics of listening I guess is something that may well come up in this discussion. Now, I should say that, of course, we're talking about memory and storytelling in the context of contemporary art and Asia. And our final guest, Paris Dufourra, is one of the artists whose work appears here at GOMA. There's a dramatic white room not far from where we're sitting right now, and it's covered in a stylized Farsi script. We're surrounded by words, but we can't read them. Nobody can read them in some ways. But Paris, to perhaps I should start by asking you about how I should describe you. Do I call you a German artist or an Iranian artist? <laughs> Actually, uh, calling me German which, uh, uh, would not be a sound familiar to me. Uh, it would be as a definition of myself as a person and as an artist uh, that would actually eliminate parts of my memory and history which are very existential uh, to me and my work. And um, so I'm really deeply Iranian but also if you would introduce me as an Iranian artist maybe the same would happen. You would. Uh, just don't talk about my history of being an immigrant, uh, living in diaspora for such a long time. So uh, I would say that uh, I have some kind of a hybrid identity and would locate myself in the space uh, in between and would not be happy to be just introduced as German or as an Iranian. Well, you're part of this exhibition, Paris, too, because Asia, in the sense of the Asia-Pacific Triennial, has been used to include West Asia. And I'm wondering what that term Asia means to you. Is it a positive term for you? Yes. Uh, um, you know, uh, Asia, this term of Asia has changed also during my, my life. Uh, growing up in Iran, I was part of Asia. My country is part of Asia. For Iranians, Iran is uh, located in Asia, so we call ourselves uh, part of Asia in Iran. But as I immigrated to Germany, um, uh, so suddenly it became different. Um, I was uh, somebody from the Middle East, and uh, you know, the German. Uh, um, term of it is even uh, more alienating because it is near east. I mean, it is very uh, a seen from the Eurocentric uh, uh, gaze, which uh, that's the part of the Asia which is near to them, so they call it near east. Um, and then, um, and then more and more, I became Oriental a person coming from Middle East uh, with very much uh, uh, um, somehow the definition of the religion as part of the identity and also very specific uh, um, uh, political situation. So going back to term of Asia being a part of this exhibition in APT 7, was uh, uh, was discovering myself again as an Asian, which was very, very nice. <laughs> now, Paula Abud, I wonder if that's something that you'd like to comment on, because in Australia, Asia is often used to talk about Southeast Asia or the part of the world closest to us, and the definition gets a bit murky somewhere around about India, um, so while Middle East is a sort of media and political term, as Paris Du said. So does her response to Asia make sense to you? Oh yes, and I think if you talk to um, people from the Arabic speaking communities, they would probably um, you know, agree with what Paris Stewart is speaking of because Middle East is a colonial term and it's, it's also a relational term because it's uh, you know, east of where and east middle of where. So, you know, then you talk about the Far East, so, and then the Near East. So these are all very colonial terms, and 
When you only define something in relational terms to yourself, you're centering yourself, so you never actually see the people as subjects with agency and cultures, and you sort of maybe put them in this box. And thus, you know, you get the term Orientalism, which um, the Palestinian um, thinker and um, writer Edward Said wrote a, a magnificent book called Orientalism, a very dense book about you know, in a way, exploring, um, seeing the so-called Middle East through Western eyes. And then, you know, he took a very sort of comparative literature approach, but it's much broader than that in art, in, in politics. We still sort of have very Orientalist ways of thinking about um, the Arab region and its peoples. And, you know, we're left with um, sort of, we're, we're confined in those spaces. So a lot of art and storytelling the work I've done certainly is about breaking down those sort of um, representations and speaking back to those representations and finding spaces that challenge those representations. And you know, the, I think art has a really important transformative role in doing that. And in fact, somebody has already sent us a message via SMS saying, I love the way APT always redefines what we think of as Asia. And there's also been a rather astute tweeter pointing out that, of course, tomorrow is International Women's Day, and just perhaps um, the makeup of the panel represents that. Um, <laughs> now, Natalie Nguyen, for some cultures, stories of dispersal and movement and migration have a very long history, but I'm wondering um, if there are folk tales and ways of talking. I mean, there, it, it often is embedded into art and so on. But I'm wondering if that's the case with Vietnam, how much there is a longer tradition of movement or if it's all about staying in place. Um, no, there isn't actually. So the, the, um, the exodus that occurred after the fall of Saigon and the collapse of South Vietnam in 1975, um, more than two million people left Vietnam over the following two decades. And it was triggered by um, uh, Vietnam being reunified under a post-war communist state. Um, and this massive movement of people away from Vietnam is very new. It's unprecedented in Vietnamese history. The Vietnamese tend to stick very closely to their homeland, or at the most, they moved uh, in nearby to, to the other country, you know, Laos or, or Thailand, you know, very, uh, very Cambodia, you know, very close to Vietnam. There were small numbers of students who went overseas, as well as numbers of indentured laborers, some of whom were sent you know, during the wars um, to, uh, to, to France and, to, and then some to New Caledonia. But, but really what, what triggered this massive exodus was 1975 and the aftermath of war. Uh, in other words, a very repressive state. And this is what people responded to. I think most people were tired after, it was nearly 30 years of war in Vietnam, and Vietnamese were tired and they were hoping to, um, you know, to, 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 to make things work after 75. Um, but the regime was so repressive that uh, the, the, the first major waves began really in, the, in, the, in around 1977-78, and then people really began to leave in very large numbers. And it was a very, um, a very clear indication of their opposition to, to the regime. Um, Does that mean then that there were no established sort of cultural modes of talking about migration or travel? I'm wondering what that means for the work you do in terms of memory and remembering that experience? Um, yes, that's a good, yeah, it's a good point that there isn't, uh, there isn't a long cultural memory uh, about this and so it was, a, it was a particularly traumatic experience for that, for that reason because there was no history uh, of, this, of this sort of migration. Um, and, um, uh, as, um, and, and the experience of refugees who left in the, in the late 70s and in the 80s was a lot of, of escapes were planned in secrecy. So it wasn't something that you could discuss with anyone because uh, you didn't want to endanger your family or friends. Um, and many people tried and failed and tried and failed repeatedly. And people tried and, 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 and then drowned, either in rivers or at sea. And then their lives, that was it. You know, their stories disappeared and no one ever knew what happened to them. I mean, my sister-in-law lost five members of her family, two sisters, a brother and two nieces. Um, they, they went on a boat in 1978 and then uh, there were more than 200 people on their boat and the entire boat disappeared. 
uh, and even now, uh, in 2013, she still refuses to say that they're dead. She still says they're missing. She still hopes that somehow they might have survived and one day, you know, they might get a call. I mean, the family made all sorts of inquiries through uh, the International Red Cross, uh, through the United Nations, but they've never rec had any news of these, uh, of these siblings. But she still refuses to believe that they're dead, uh, even after all these years. Now, Beck, Natalie was talking about loss there, but also about the importance of place and belonging in Vietnamese culture. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering then how much that's central to your work and storytelling. Um, look, I think, you know, a lot of my films are obviously about Aboriginal families, people, subject matter, and I think loss is obviously something that, um, you know, features in, in people's memories. And in and in in stories and in and, and in life. I mean, a lot of people obviously have been removed and have lost their language and all all of these all of these things. Um, but I, I guess for, for me, I mean, one of my favourite films that I've ever made is a film called Law of Love. And the woman that's in that film, I don't know if any of you guys have seen Samson Delilah, but if you have, the nana in that is a woman called Mitchley. Gibson, and sadly she passed away a couple of years ago, but I did a documentary with her, and I was telling you this before, Kate, that um, it's called The Law of Love, and basically we took Mitchley back to where she was born and where she lived as a, all, all her life until she was a young woman. Um, and she lived um, at this place called Lake Mackay and up until she was maybe in her early 20s. She'd never had laid her eyes on a white person before. They were living completely a traditional existence. Um, and her family had been separated from, from the men, so the women were sort of on their own. Um, there was a drought happening and all these other things were, were happening. But it was really fascinating because um, we were travelling for days and days and days off-road off going to this place called Lake Mackay and um, it's something absolutely amazing. I'll never, ever forget it happened. Um, Mitchell East sort of said, stop, stop, stop the car. And she jumped out, she sort of waddled over to this grass that was about this high and she just started, you know, looking through the grass. And within about, I kid you not, five minutes, um, she located a soakage that she would visit as a young girl um, with her family when they were living in the, the bush, you know, and obviously travelling from one place to the other with seasons and things. Um, it, was a, it was where they got their water from. She hadn't been back there since she was, you know, 20 years of age, and at this point of time she might have been 90. We don't even know how old she was. But it was just extraordinary, just, um, you know, her, the strength of her memory and it was all connected to survival and understanding of who she was and where she came from and um, and it's I wasn't filming at the time and it's something that will never be repeated and doesn't really matter but um, I do love telling that story because I think it's just really powerful sort of example of the connection this woman had with her place and and her memory I mean this was a 90 year old woman and but you were also travelling with her granddaughter, weren't you? Yeah. So you were making a connection between the past and the present and the place yeah. in that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, her granddaughter Jessie was um, just graduating from St Philip's, which is a Catholic school in Alice Springs, which is where I live. And um, you know, it's one of those typical graduations where the girls wear the gowns, and um, she had the date, and her boyfriend was wearing a tux, and all this sort of thing. So the idea was to take young Jessie, who was about to turn 18 as well back to her grandmother's country where she'd not been um, or hadn't been there since she was a little girl um, and learn about traditional coming of age, like sexy stuff, love stuff, love magic, love songs. Um, they're immediately talking about being, you know, sharing her husband with two other women. Those two other women were there as well. It was just an extraordinary exchange. Um, and just within that, in that space and at that time, there was Jessie, this beautiful, young, ambitious Aboriginal girl and her ancient, old, incredibly sage nana, you know. Mm. I like the idea of talking more about love magic, mm. actually, and I'm just wondering... It's really, <laughs> <laughs> really sexy stuff. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering, actually, for all of you, how much... Because we've been talking about loss and migration and movement and identity, whether love magic is something that comes into the, the sort of stories that you collect. Is it part of the story work that you do, Paula? Um, it's, when you said that, it made me think of a project I was working on um, with Afghan women in Sydney. Um, I'd been probably working with the women for about two years, 
And it was just before September 11th, and we were doing storytelling workshops, and the women were sort of recounting their stories and poetry around their experiences of displacement from Afghanistan into refugee camps in um, Pakistan and Iran, and the way they were treated there, and then finally ending up in Australia. So that, you know, they were stories of displacement. And then September 11th happened and a lot of the women stopped coming because they were being attacked in the streets. So the public space became quite violent for them and they were scared to come out and we were trying to find ways to make them feel safe so they could continue to participate because storytelling is also a healing. Um, I think it's as much as healing as an empowering process. So we ended up starting up a new project where one of the women um, specialised in a form of poetry, it's an oral form of poetry called Dubaiti poetry. And it was mostly women who, um, I guess, used this poetry. And it was an oral tradition and you didn't have to be literate to use this tradition. And the women said, you know, this poetry is a love poetry. It's poetry of love. And, um, you know, traditionally we make this poetry to talk about love and to nurture love and to think about love and here in Australia after 30 years of war and we've lost our husbands and our sons and our daughters and our country and our family, I can't make poetry of love. So this Dubaiti poetry, the women started using this form but writing about displacement and dislocation and loss and grief. So a tra traditional form of love poetry turned into a form to talk about grief and loss because they felt so bereft of love and, you know, couldn't find love in their lives. And, you know, part of this process was trying to find love in their lives, but it was, I think it's a really difficult process for communities that are, that feel so isolated and displaced and have never really, the women have never really had a time to mourn or grieve for what's happened to them. So I think sometimes love, it's there, you know, they, they get up every day and love their children, but, you know, to write love poetry was really hard for them. Paris, do I wonder if that's something that you'd like to respond to? Because in some ways you're an artist in exile and, and certainly grief is part of the work that you do. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if there is also space for, for love or if it is all about exploring loss. Um, you know, what I, um, if I would say, if I would just uh, uh, talk about a difference that I feel uh, in my position and what has been talking about in the panel, that would be that uh, um, in my case I feel also some kind of a rebellion against my own culture. It is not uh, only uh, trying to redefine the belongings, but it is a simultaneity of, um, of getting rid of it or somehow uh, pushing it back, pushing back the boundaries of it that I have been uh, brought up with. Um, um, trying to explore the, the, the liberty uh, uh, also if you change it, if you just don't accept the boundaries of it. And in this process of um, subverting it, but at the same time feeling belong to it, which is very, it is, it is a very uh, um, uh, sometimes a difficult position of in between. I will, I do, what I do is just try to, to to redefine my relationship and uh, um, open up uh, spaces that um, that would just expand the meanings, expand the relationship, and um, uh, locate myself in this space of in between and try to make it livable with my art. Thank you very much for that, that response, Paris Du. And I should say too that we are getting some, some tweets and, and comments in, including one um, from somebody asking whether the panellists see their role in creating history as much as recovering it. And Natalie Nguyen, I'm wondering if that's something you'd like to respond to because you work with oral history, so you're collecting narratives. And so I wonder 
how you would respond to um, to that question? Um, yes, well, we are. Uh, I, I, I am recovering uh, oral histories and narratives, and I'm recreating them. I mean, there's always that pro process of uh, interpretation, and then of conveying that that information across to the reader, who would then reinterpret it in turn. Um, so yes, I definitely see it as both recovery as well as uh, a, re a process of uh, recovery as well as recreation. Um, well, tell us more about the actual recovery that you're doing though, because I think that, because we've been talking about loss and lost stories, but whose stories are missing from the story that we know in part about the Vietnamese experience in Australia? Um, well, I, I just uh, completed a five-year project on Vietnamese women because, and I wanted to, to work on women because women have generally been very quiet in the public sphere. So the people would hear about what men had done and sometimes the, uh, the information wasn't very positive. It had to do with drugs or or some other you know, negative image. But the women were very silent throughout all of this. So I thought it was really important to, to gather their stories and to, to gather the stories of the first generation in particular because it is a generation that is beginning to die out, to, to, to disappear. And it's generally the, uh, you know, a much quieter generation. Um, but, but now I'm actually recovering another set of forgotten voices and it's uh, those of the, the soldiers of South Vietnam who've been really the forgotten soldiers of the war. There's been a lot written about uh, the North Vietnamese, the Americans, the Australians and the others who were involved. Um, but the South Vietnamese soldiers have been forgotten. Even, but, and, but, and they are acknowledged here in Australia. They, they've marched on Anzac Day since 1981. So I think it's really important to gather the, the histories of these men before, before they disappear. But um, you told me the other day that there are women soldiers who march on Anzac yes, Day in Australia Yes, and I mean, too. If, if the men have been forgotten, the women have been completely, completely <laughs> forgotten. <laughs> So I, in my last book, I had a chapter on four, four women who were um, soldiers in the South Vietnamese um, armed forces. And one served in the Airborne Division for seven years. So there's a photograph of, of her parachuting out of a plane in 1957. And these stories are completely unknown. Uh, nobody remembers. Uh, these women uh, all volunteered to serve their country during wartime. Um, unlike um, you know, the, the, the great push you know, to get men into the army, nobody asked them to do this. And a lot of them volunteered and did so against uh, a great deal of family opposition. I mean, one of them was beaten by her brother when he found out that <laughs> she was in the army, even though he was in the army as well. So they, had to, they were very strong-willed women. They saw the army as, a, as, a, as, a, as an opportunity, as a way of, um, of being proactive, of, of um, asserting you know, their independence. So quite, quite astonishing stories. Well, and again, that, that very much helps complicate our idea of where Australia sits in relationship to Asia and the stories that we know. And I should say for anybody who's watching out there online um, or listening, we're on Big Ideas on Radio National. I'm Kate Evans and we're talking um, in the context, we're talking um, on Goma Talks and, um, and we also may have a question or comment from the audience in just a moment, if you'd like to um, let, our, um, let people know, because we do have a roving radio mic. So while you think about any question or comment you might like to make, I should say we've got a few more comments um, on Twitter. And, um, and Paris, do I should let you know that there's some very, very positive one from somebody saying they love what you had to say about at once subverting the culture, but also trying to find a place in it and where you belong. And another comment on SMS was that living and working in between seems to be the place where the most interesting work is being made. Being in between, is that something that you do, Paula? Um, yeah, uh, I think that's a very familiar term in community culture work. Um, you often hear a lot of second generations talking about living in between. and I think the whole idea of being in between or outside you know, I think sometimes you're more critical and um, perceptive about the centre, and I think you you challenge things more. So, and you know, not belonging sometimes a good thing. Um, you know, but I think a lot of you know a lot of us aspire to belong. When I'm working with young people, I think I was actually having a conversation in the taxi today um, with the taxi driver, and he was talking about how his son just wants to belong. So he, he doesn't want to learn the language. He doesn't want to know the stories. He just wants to belong. 
And I said, look, you know, a lot of communities go through this and, you know, when he's older, he'll value the stories and the language and he'll come back and reclaim and go through a whole process of re reclaiming. And, you know, I think in between is uh, a space that's as valuable as any other space because it, it brings up uh, different sorts of stories. And, I mean, the, the creating history is really important because in community culture work, the stories of the people are social history. For me, that's really what history is. It's not the, the big stories and the big wars and the big, you know, I guess, news of the day. It's the little stories that make history um, meaningful. And I, I love people's historians because they capture the stories of real lives. And I think you make more meaning out of those stories than the big ones sometimes. And Beck Cole, of course, you've done both of those things, haven't you? By working on the, the big history series, you were taking a very broad scope, but you also tell intimate stories, don't you? Yeah, and I think with First Australians, one of the th really interesting things that came out of that and became quite apparent pretty quickly was that actually the really beautiful stories and the really powerful stories were the ones where there was a real connection between um, Aboriginal people in various places within the country and the newcomers, like those first relationships, some of them um, weren't always negative. Um, you know, there was always a, a degree of sort of um, mystery and, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, curiosity. Um, and, and sometimes really meaningful friendships as well. Um, but yeah, I guess for me personally, it's funny because the film that I've made recently is called The Place Between. Um, and it's about, yeah, just that, you know, being, it was renamed Here I Am actually, but it was about a, um, you know, a woman being caught between <coughs> being released from prison and trying to live an independent life again. And I think that's, um, it's a very common sort of scenario, obviously, for lots of sort of disadvantaged people. But um, um, I think we all feel sort of at sea, you know, we all share that sort of feeling every now and then. And Natalie, you wanted to comment there? Oh, I just wanted to comment on the whole issue of in-between. I was thinking of cross-cultural relationships. And one of the couples that I took I talked about it in my book. Uh, in my book, was it was a very touching love story between a young Vietnamese woman and an Egyptian man um, here in, here in Melbourne, and they met at English class. And his English was actually better than hers, but, but he fell in love with her, so he pretended his English wasn't good enough, so they, they kept on trying to shift him to another class. And he kept on saying, no, 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 I, I want to stay in this class so that he could be with her. And um, she, she'd, uh, she'd lost her father by then, and her mother had, had cancer, and he basically inserted himself into, into their lives, because initially her mother was very worried about this relationship because she thought, my daughter is Vietnamese, uh, he's Egyptian, you know, they're, they're both learning English, you know, how can they communicate properly? But basically he was the one who drove her mother to, to, the, to the Peter McCallum Hospital uh, for treatment. So he, he moved, you know, he moved in an, into, into an apartment close to the family. So bit by bit he sort of, um, um, reassured them and eventually her mother accepted the relationship. And it's, a, it's not only a cross-cultural relationship between two people from very different parts of the world who would never have met if it wasn't for, for, being, for having arrived in Australia, but uh, she's, of a, she's from a Buddhist family and he's from a Christian family. And um, she said that, um, she told him that her mother really didn't want her to change her religion, so she wanted to stay Buddhist. So when his mother came to visit them from Egypt, um, he, he, he explained that the picture, there, there was actually a, a, a picture, a frame of the Buddha, um, he, he explained to her in, that it was just the smiling grandfather of the family. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a really nice story. And <laughs> What was it you were wanting to do in that project, in exploring cross-cultural relationships? What, what was it that you were wanting to get to the bottom of? Um, I, I, because I, you know, I was interested for a number of reasons. Well, historically, the Vietnamese are not open to cross-cultural relationships, and that's, uh, that's partly because of the colonial, colonial past. Um, and, and war as well. So um, um, with Vietnamese women who had relations you know, with foreign men were, were sort of were considered very much, uh, uh, you, know, were, you know, were considered in a negative light. So I thought it was interesting to explore the stories of women who, who have gone into relationship 
relationships with non-Vietnamese men. I mean, there are a lot in my family. They've done so throughout the generations, but it's a bit of an unusual family. But in terms of the stories of the women now, I mean, the marriages range from Asia in the 1960s, in other words, uh, Australians who married Vietnamese women during, during the war years, to, to the more contemporary stories, like the story of, uh, of that young Vietnamese woman and the Egyptian man. So uh, I, I was interested because this, it's, it's so difficult, I mean, you were talking about love, and love is so difficult to start off with, but when you have two people from very different cultural backgrounds, and sometimes from different cultural backgrounds and different religious backgrounds, and, uh, and, both, and, and they're communicating in a language that is not their own, there are all these added challenges, so it's a great joy when you see that they somehow make it work, that love does, love is enough in, in those instances. Well, and, and one of our listeners online is enjoying it as well because he or she has just said, love magic, hope, histories, poetry, loss, women soldiers, refugees, belonging, and smiling Buddhas. Mm -hmm. they're, um, they're enjoying themselves. Now, I just wonder if there's anybody here in the audience, though, who'd like to ask a question or make a comment. And um, it's a little hard for me to see you, so you may need to jump up and down and, um, <laughs> and let me know if you're going to. And no, we have a very shy audience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you're listening on Twitter, the hashtag is GomaTalks, then make a comment or ask a question there. Now, Natalie's given us a whole lot of new themes to explore by mentioning both colonialism and war in one sentence. It's very, very useful. But in some ways, that means we're talking about the idea of events that change the world, which is also the sort of putative topic for today. Um, and again, we're talking about this in the context of Australia and Asia. But I wonder if we use that model, events that change the world, whether we're giving too much weight to some events over others. And Paula Abood, you've argued for a long time, I think, that one event, 9-11, is given too much weight in terms of its impact on the world. Um, yes, I suppose, because I've, I've worked with refugees for 25 years and Refugees, a lot of, at that time I remember reflecting on sort of the empathy for um, people who had great loss during September 11th. And a lot of refugee communities were saying, we've ha had great loss, but there has never been any empathy for us. And I remember um, someone had written an essay called, um, you know, it was almost like empathy deficit disorder. Why do we have empathy for some people and not other people? And is it because sometimes there's not a camera around and we don't see other people suffering or we can't see the humanity in other people's stories? And so I remember, you know, at that time, you know, Grozny had been raised to the ground and Chechens were going through very violent, sort of, were being repressed very violently and Bosnians had been through a great struggle and Sudanese and Lebanese and Palestinians and many, many different communities. So I guess many of us were ref reflecting on why does one event um, become such a major event because it, it became known as the day that changed the world. But for many others, um, communities and individuals who've been through war and trauma and conflict and occupation and colonialism and genocide, they're, they have different days that change the world. So it was about, you know, uh, us thinking about how we um, privilege some sufferings over other sufferings. And, you know, Af certainly Afghanistan has had 30 years of, of constant invasions and, you know, there's nothing left of the cities and countrysides, you know, and people live in such, such extreme poverty. And, um, you know, I've worked with a lot of those communities. So for me, it was just about, you know, some balance in how we come to certain, um, I guess, certain sufferings and, and how we, how we empathise with other peoples whose sufferings don't get um, valued in or, or seen in the same way. And if we're not talking then about a, a clear cut event, but a, a whole process, mm. then I guess given that we are in Australia, it's a little hard to, um, <laughs> to ignore colonialism. Is that something, Beck, that you feel that your work comes back to again and again, the whole contact history and colonialism, or is it too, too big a process to actually come to terms with? Oh, look, I, always, I think it's always there, bubbling away in the background, but I've, I make a sort of conscious decision to um, make films and question 
a Aboriginal people themselves about ways that we can change our own world. And, um, and that's why a lot, a lot of my films, my documentary work, focuses on young people and giving them a voice and hearing what they have to say about their own lives and their own futures and the way they see their place in the world and where, where they sit, you know. Um, but, I mean, I guess in, in my life and in, through my father and my grandfather and my own personal history, um, you know, there's obviously those, those moments in time that, that won't mean a lot to a lot of people but mean a lot to me and have shaped the way my family is, I guess. But, you know, so, uh, I mean, I personally, I personally, I like to look to the future and I like to hear what young people have to say about it in my work, yeah. Well, and also I'm struck by when we talk about these events, even what they are historically isn't always clear. So in Australian school books, our idea of what and when the Vietnam War happened, for example, might be quite different to a Vietnamese Australian experience of it, where there's the whole process of dispossession of war and even of the whole French colonial experience before that, I guess. Um, yeah, um, because in, well, I, I always sort of I see the the war as basically stretching for thirty years from the end of the Second World War in nineteen forty five to the fall of Saigon in nineteen seventy five, uh, and most uh, the country I mean there were there were some quiet times but most of throughout a lot of that time the country was at war, and I think um, people people were very critical of of, of South Vietnam. Um, and what happened in the South. And there were a great many flaws in the South, but it was also a country that had experienced years of war. And I think it, it's sometimes difficult for others to, to, to try to understand what it is like to live uh, in, a, in, in a country that has experienced war for such an extended period of time. I um, mean, people do go on with their lives. You know, people marry, people have children. People entertain hopes for the future, but the war is always there. There's always, uh, you know, that background in, in, in war, and practically every man uh, was in, served in the army at one point or another. So uh, there was a whole generation, uh, several generations of, of men, I should say, who served in the army, and the the death toll was huge in, in the South. About one in five, possibly one in five men, was 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 badly wounded or was killed during the war. And so well, they were very, so practical, so every family lost someone. And the, the effect on a society when people have been through such traumatic grief, um, you have to, people need to take that into account when they look at, at the history of the country and the sort of damage that, that it does. But people still fought. I mean, the South tried to remain independent. The, the South wanted to resist the communist North. Uh, it failed in that. Uh, and it lost a huge number of people. But, but from the point of view of, of the South, that's what the South tried to do for 20 years. It, it, it lost the war, but it doesn't make you know, what it tried to do any less worthy. Or, uh, and for, for all the soldiers who died during the war, and we remember not only you know, the quarter million soldiers of the South who died, but the many soldiers from the six nations who, who, who supported the South, um, that this is what they were trying to do. Uh, and in terms of that process, though, when we were speaking the other day, you were pointing out how long the actual refugee process was, an extraordinarily long time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, <coughs> the, um, in terms of the, the, the refugee and re resettlement program, yes, I mean, when, um, with the Indochinese refugee crisis, I mean, there was a huge uh, um, response from the international community. Uh, the United Nations had, there were two international uh, con conferences in, in Geneva, one in 1979 and one in 1989, and they were to deal specifically with the Indochinese refugee crisis. Crisis. So there was a whole network of camps in Southeast Asia. And from the time um, the Vietnamese refugees first started to leave Vietnam, which happened immediately after the fall of Saigon, uh, to the time when the last camp in Hong Kong closed, which was in 2000, it was a 25-year migration and resettlement program, which is quite unprecedented. I don't think we've seen anything like that since. Um, and I think, you know, from Vietnamese refugees were particularly fortunate at that time that there was such a, such a response from the international community um, in terms of their, 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 very, their very visible plight. And uh, it's very, it's very dif different for, for refugees now. 
Well, and different too for people who are in exile because of regime change and, and yeah. other political changes, which is where, if I could go back to you, Paristu, um, you know, there has been enormous political change in Iran and your work sometimes explicitly deals with that and in other times it seems that it's a sort of embedded response. But I, is it fair to say, though, that your artwork is seen to be subversive by the um, Iranian political system? Yes, that's... Uh, yes, you can, you can say that, or I would say that myself as well. That's... Uh, <clears throat> Sorry, um, I, I would uh, place myself actually in the Iranian opposition as an activist, um, but um, of course um, I'm not trying to address uh, all the political issues in my work, but uh, as it has become more and more existential for my life, uh, the, um, uh, dealing with that somehow you can see it in my artwork as well, but for me there is uh, something very fundamental difference between the, this um, uh, um, uh, being a political activist and an artist. Uh, I think that, uh, or for myself, that the place I open up in my art is a place of uh, reflection and also to, to explore the existential questions that are also doubts and grief and anger and the rebellion, but not, not, uh, not trying to find answers of, uh, um, in terms of political questions. Um, so there is, a, there is a huge difference in between, between this kind of, uh, these two ways of thinking and acting. Uh, but uh, of course my uh, artistic uh, approach and m myself as a person, I'm a very, very, very political person and uh, very much subversive against this. Uh, what um, um, the, the the religious dictatorship which is ruling my country. It seems though that the way in which you express your opposition can be quite stylized. Um, and just thinking about the work in the building where we are now, with yeah. that, that beautiful room full of script. And so I'm wondering where you see the role of beauty in art. Yeah and whether you see that as part of that uh, sort of critical use of art. What, what role yeah. is beauty for you? Um, you know, in many of my works, um, maybe um, also in this work that uh, is shown in Goma, um, the beauty um, uh, you, it's the, the beauty, the surfaces of which are very beautiful and uh, very attractive to the viewers. But um, going a little bit deeper, it's also irritating. It is uh, the, 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 for example, if I just uh, talk about the work on the show, um, a language must give you uh, orientation, also the space gives you orientation, but the way I am putting this script on the space, but also using the, the script of Farsi, it is disorienting because um, the text uh, or the script is illegible. Even if uh, people can read Farsi, they cannot read this text. It's, it's fragments, it's fragmented, these are just uh, I just write it going with the rhythm of writing. It is the surface of it. It's like a memory, a beautiful memory of my mother tongue, which has lost its function in my everyday life as an immigrant. But at the, other, uh, at the same time, another layer of the work is how I put it in the space given to me, as an, uh, because the space has got own its own, uh, its own architecture, its own rules, up, down, and uh, different uh, uh, directions. The script uh, 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 um, covers the space uh, like a second skin, but does not obey 
the rules of the architecture. So it's at the same time breaking it. So it is, um, it is some kind of a liberation, but also loss at the same time. And that is the irritating point of it. And also it is something which is, uh, which is beautiful, but at the same time sad. So this uh, simultaneity of contrasting feelings and perceptions, that is what I am very much interested to, uh, to explore and to find ways to, uh, uh, to show, actually. Beautiful and sad, Paula. I'm wondering how much in your work as a collector of, story, of stories, that is, that's what you encounter. Um, I, I think stories ultimately are healing, even though in the telling there, there can be much sadness in the telling. And I remember working with a group of Sierra Leonean women who had just come out of a war zone and we started a storytelling project and the women ended up calling their book the Book of the Living because they used that storytelling circle, the story circle, as a healing process, they'd said, we don't want to go to a psychologist, a clinical psychologist, and tell our stories, you know, each one of us sitting down and having to start from the beginning, culturally inappropriate, don't want to do that. We actually want to sit in a circle of women and bring our stories up. And as each woman brought her story up, she would fall to the ground in grief, and the other women would bring the woman back up with song. And this ended up being their mo the mourning process because they had no time to mourn. They had left the camps and lost their families and this story circle became a, a, a where grief was expressed but also a healing process. So even in the process of sadness and deep grief, I think there's some joy in being able to heal and it's a slow process but I think the, the beautiful um, Vietnamese theorist Trinh Minh Ha has talked about storytellers are often the healers in, in a lot of cultures around the world and you know the healers know everyone, the storytellers and the healers know everyone's story and even in the sadness of telling the story is still named joy and they're Trinh Minh Ha's words which are very beautiful poetic words to think about story. Well, it, it puts a whole weight, though, on the person asking the story, doesn't it? So what, does that, what impact does that have on you, Natalie, as somebody who is asking people to offer up these stories that might be about beauty and sadness or devastation and loss? Um, it's sometimes very, very difficult um, because it's very, it, it's very personal for me because of my own background. Um, and... Um, Trauma can be quite infectious. So, I mean, there was a, in the one of the, sto the, the stories that I did was about a, was a, of a Vietnamese woman who lost uh, uh, who lost her two boys during the, the escape from Vietnam, a six-year-old and a seven-year-old, and they were um, they were their boat was attacked by pirates and. Um, the only survivors were in fact four women because they were taken apart to be raped by the pirates. Everyone else, all the other, all the men, all the children, were were thrown out, uh, were thrown were thrown overboard. So they they drowned. She rem she, she she saw them drown. So um, it's a it's a really tra traumatic account. So the, her account was traumatic. The person who actually transcribed the the account, got, you know, was was crying about it. The person who translated the account, you know, was crying about it. So it it was there were all these different levels of trauma. Um, but there's a, um, there's a great deal of, uh, um, of beauty as well. And I also wanted, oddly enough, when we're talking about conveying stories, I, I, was, I wanted to talk about the silences. Um, because there were, when I was speaking to women, they often, uh, I had several women say to me, I've never spoken of this before. And I can't speak to my own daughter about this. I can't speak to my own children about this. But I'm glad that I'm speaking to you because I hope that one day my daughter will read your book and she will understand my story. But I cannot speak to her myself. So there are, there are some experiences that are just too difficult to, um, you know, to, to convey across the generations. I mean, women, uh, I mean one, one thing that's very much underreported among Vietnamese refugee women is rape. Um, very few will admit to their families that they've been raped. 
So I would, I would have you know, children talk about their parents' stories and say, everyone was raped except my mother. She wasn't raped. She was, she was, she was, she was protected. And I, 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 I sort of think, hmm, that's rather unlikely, but it might have been something that the mother said to, to reassure the child and not to, not to so, so that she would not have to, to speak about that experience. And is that what you see the role of filmmaking and documentary making for, is to somehow address some of those silences, Beck? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, I, I think generally, I mean, my, my father's Aboriginal, my mum's not. Um, and I, I kind of grew up, my dad worked at Karma, which is a Central Australian Aboriginal Media Association, from when I was about 15 onwards. Someone's asked why, what was my attraction to in telling Aboriginal stories, and I guess that's the answer to that. It's just I grew, grew up amongst it, um, and it's part of my own personal sort of history as well. I've gone completely off track. What was your question? <laughs> <laughs> the role of filmmaking, whether it is to fill those silences. Yes, yes. Um, look, I think, I think women particularly feel like they haven't, had an opportunity to, to be heard. Um, I, I know that a lot of people feel like, um, of course, we've been written out of history, and that's changing as, as time sort of progresses. But, um, but a absolutely, and I think the whole movement of um, Aboriginal filmmaking now is really sort of filling that, that void and, and, um, and giving so many people a, a voice. And it's, it's been long overdue, I think, and it's... it's um, it's always tougher with documentaries, like what, what you say is um, really moving to me because you, there's such a big responsibility, isn't there? And, you, and, and, it's, and it's heartbreaking and it's um, overwhelming and, and, and moving and joyful and all of those, all of those things. And, and as the person that's sort of taking the story or um, being told the story, you have to kind of navigate your way really gently through that. And um, it's interesting, it's similar in my experience that um, I've been told stories that... Um, that um, women haven't told their own children, you know, and, and it's simply um, perhaps they haven't been asked in the right way or the, the, the platform hasn't been presented in a way that they feel safe and secure enough to, to um, go ahead and do it and maybe they just see it as a, one of the few opportunities that they'll ever get to actually tell their stories and it's a real gift and something that you don't ever take for granted ever. That's an incredibly powerful point on, on which to end, I think. This is Goma Talks online on Big Ideas and on Twitter. We've been speaking to filmmaker Beck Cole, writer and filmmaker Paula Aboud, historian and academic Natalie Nguyen, and artist Paris Du Farrar. And I'd like to thank you all for your very, very thoughtful responses and to thank you all as an audience too for coming along to this second session of Goma Talks APT7 tonight and joining in the discussion on SMS and Twitter. Now, the next event is Goma Talks Living Contemporary Culture on Thursday, the 21st of March, with my colleague ABC RN's Weekend Arts host, Sarah Konofsky. And you can watch past Goma Talk sessions online at Quagoma TV through the gallery's website. I'm Kate Evans from Books Plus and Books and Arts Daily and Big Ideas on RN. Thank you all and good night. <laughs>